but has been recently inspired by the work that you, Bob, and also Samson was doing on category theory. So although what I'm doing is not category theory, uh, it is in the spirit of category theory, and I think you and I have been talking about it, perhaps we could do a proper category theory of these ideas. The basic idea is to start with the notion of process. To try and understand quantum phenomena by using the idea of process, not process in space-time, but a more general notion of process from which space and time are to be abstracted. It's a rather ambitious program. Uh, it actually hasn't worked yet, but it's a, something I've been working on for a long time. So how do we go about it? The first idea is, what is process? I want to take process as uh, my basic form in my description. And uh, I'm taking it in the spirit, perhaps, in Whitehead's notion of an idea of a function, that you take the function as basic. Or perhaps even more in Bill Lovier's idea of the morphism. And I was introduced to this idea by Couturier, Gerard Couturier, many years ago. Uh, and it seemed to be the spirit in which uh, <coughs> I was trying to think about these things. And the idea is in that expression there that the concept of motion as the presence of a body in one place at one time, another place at another time, describes only the result of motion and does not contain an explanation of motion. Now, in using this idea of, of morphism or mapping or function, we take that as basic. I don't know whether that explains what motion is, but we take that as basic. In other words, we take motion as basic. And then we try to abstract from the relations in that motion uh, the idea of space, time, and so on. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with this mathematically. I'm going to start with group points. And I'm going to show how you can very quickly come up to Clifford algebras. And in fact, you can get the three main Clifford algebras. And at this stage, there's nothing quantum about it. I'm just giving those names to those particular algebras because they're algebras that are, that are used in quantum mechanics. But my approach at the moment has not put anything quantum in it. Then what I want to do is to have a look at the Clifford bundle that comes out of that. And from that, I'll show you how you can get the Lycan structure. And this ties up very much with Penrose's ideas, although I won't touch on exactly what the relation between the two are. Then the important thing I want to do is I want to add a symplectic structure in here. And when I add the symplectic structure, I actually get a non commutative phase space. And it is really here that I think quantum mechanics enters. And this is very similar to the structure of Moyal using deformed Poisson algebras, although I won't have time to actually discuss the relationship. And then finally, uh, the idea is that one constructs shadow phase spaces, and one has this non-commutative structure, I'll call it an algebra at the moment, and from that you uh, can map out shadow manifolds, and there are a whole series of shadow manifolds that are possible from that, and we'll see exactly what that means. And one of the surprising things that I found, and maybe people in the audience who know what I work on <coughs> will say I find no surprise in this at all, but I find that these shadow manifolds are actually uh, very closely related to the Bohm approach to quantum mechanics. And I did not expect that. Okay. <clears throat> now, as I say, should it be categories or should it be algebras? My own starting point was in terms of algebras. Because I uh, was very fascinated with some of the early history of the subject, particularly Hamilton and Grassman. And they were talking, Grassman in particular emphasised that mathematics was not about material reality, but about thought. Now for a physicist that was a very shocking idea to me. But it enables one to actually free oneself from the, the physical reality that physicists find themselves in. And one of the things that I was trying to do was to get away from our normal ideas and to come in from a much more radical point of view. So, the idea was that we can think about thought as sort of a, a metaphor for this idea of process. It's really about becoming. It's really about how one 
the old thought becomes the new thought. Can one really make a sharp separation between the old thought and the new thought? Or are they uh, linked in some way where one shouldn't really make a, a, a separation? One should make a distinction, and here I'm using uh, Luke Kaufman's idea. I don't know my pointer won't work. Is it working? I suppose, yeah. Uh, here I'm using Luke Kaufman's idea where you start with, say, a blank piece of paper, you make a distinction, and the distinction is the important thing, and then you have two sides to this particular process, and you can look at that particular symbolism for this idea of the uh, splitting the thought, but you're not splitting it, you want to keep it as one entity, and so the entity they are going to write mathematically like this, and then I'm going to put together these primitive uh, uh, processes by means of a multiplication rule and this will lead me to the idea of a groupoid. So I'm starting effectively with the notion of groupoid. Now let's take a closer look at this. Adam, sorry, you can't. Yeah. Can you explain? I'm not quite with you. Can you go back and... Yeah. What, what is T1 and T2? These are just two distinct features in some process that you're looking at. But I talk about actual thoughts, aren't I? I, I can, I can, I, for that, that I'm using that as an, an analogy at the moment. These are actual thoughts. But I want to make it my... But is, I want this, to is this about psychology or what? No, no, it's going to be about physics. Anyway. No, it's not, I don't want to be about psychology. No, it's, no, it's not going to be about... I'm, I'm not going to give you the insights into consciousness, please. <laughs> okay. But I just want to use that idea. We can, we can think of them as two states, two quantum states, if you like. If you want to come down to them. Physics. It's a quite a general idea of making a distinction and then looking at the relation between the two aspects of that distinction. It'll come clear, I hope. Okay. So let's have a look. Why am I calling these groupoids? Well, because I've got a, a source P, I've got a target T, and in fact I'll show that we will get a group. Uh, but that's going to come in in a minute because it's how I re relate these. Uh, elements that can bring in the group structure. So I get my combine I combine arrows in this particular way. Then what I find in here is that I've got a left unity, P1, P1, I've got a right unity, and I've got an inverse. And the interpretation, and this is the important feature of this, is that P1, P2 is P1 becoming P2. So this is the way I'm trying to put my process in there. And then P1, P1 is going to be our being. That is something that keeps repeating itself. In fact, the keep repeating itself, if we have this idea of multiplication here, is P1, P1 is idempotent. And to me, the idempotents are very important things. They are the description of the being. I'm using this in a very general sense at the moment. Okay, now we need some algebraic structure on here, so let me bring it out and spell it out very clearly right from the beginning. I'm allowing multiplication with a scalar, and I'm denoting that, meaning that the meaning that means that I've got the strength of the process. So if I want to make the process very strong, I can make K very large. I then want my process to be directed, so I'm saying that AB is equal to minus BC. I'm now putting in my multiplication rule, and this is the important rule which I'll be working on, and I call this the order of succession. One process followed by another process followed by another process. And there you see I've got plus and minus, and I'll show you why there's a choice there. I then get also the order of coexistence, and I look at addition as the order of coexistence. I'm also making it uh, associative, uh, but I'm not defining things like this at the moment. Now, at first when I was playing around with this, I thought, well, okay, you're on your own, BJ. I hope you know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, I'm BJ, all right? <laughs> And lo and behold, I was suddenly uh, introduced to Luke Kaufman's iterant algebra. 
and you find that in his uh, physics and knots. And what you find is that the multiplication he's using, which is that multiplication there, is a special case of the multiplication I'm using here. And it's rather amusing that I was introduced to Lou Kaufman by Alex Comfort. Alex Comfort, if you remember, wrote The Joy of Sex. So I thought, obviously I'm doing something right if Alex introduces me to Lou. <laughs> I'm not going to make any more comments. <laughs> then also, uh, I was introduced to some work by young Yanis. Is he still yes, around? Yeah. He's still around, but not here. Not here, okay. He still exists. Yeah. And Sir Patrick, which again was using uh, the same a similar multiplication rule, except he was using a delta function here, which I was just using plus and minus one. And then finally, Bob came bounding in one day in Vecher in Sweden with his diagrams and suddenly inspired me to say, oh, we're doing the same thing actually, can we bring the ideas together? And that's where I thought that going back to category theory would be a good idea, but I've totally, uh, I've totally failed that because I'm not very good at category theory. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, when, when you write the square brackets, yeah. does yeah. that mean um, there is a unique morphism from A to B? No, no, I'm just meaning they're, they're two objects, two, two things. You'll see in a minute how I separate them, but they're two objects that we separate with a distinction, but they really are one thing, two aspects of one process. I don't mean anything more than that. Does that help? You could, if you wish, call them an arrow, though. Well, I've got to denote them by an arrow. It's a movement. I've got to go from something to something else. Right. And I'm just keeping that something general at the moment. So, and, and A is one thing and B is something else. Something else. But they're really two poles of the same process. So, perhaps directly you should think of square brackets A, B as just some arrow from A. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is, this is Grassman's yeah, idea. Yeah, I was going to say, just I'm by way of... Grassman's idea. Yeah, I was just going to say, just by way of kind of orientation, yeah. like I'll yeah. I mean, this essentially is, is, is coming from Grassman's idea of the way that Grassman introduced the Grassman product. That's right. Same if you look at the original Grassman work, he uses this symbolism and gets out what we call today Grassman algebras from this type of consideration. Okay? Right, so now the, the idea behind this is that from process we're going to try and abstract out space and time. Okay? Now, just to help that I'm not, uh, for me more than anything else, to help my ego a little bit, I'm not the only one who's actually been thinking about this. I mean, Hamilton himself, which we've discussed, Einstein also thought about this. Perhaps the success of Heisenberg's method points to a purely algebraic description of nature. That is, to eliminate the continuous functions from space, that's what I don't agree with. Then, however, we must give up in principle the space-time continuum. And the matrix, the Heisenberg matrix, you'll see I'll be bringing it in in the symplectic structure. And then, of course, there's Wheeler's classic uh, day one geometry. It's not day one geometry, day two physics, but day one the quantum principle, whatever that is. Day two. That's the sequence we're doing. And I was also inspired, the reason why I went to the algebras to concentrate on the algebras was I was inspired by Gelfand's construction that if you've got a commutative algebra, the traditional way of dealing with it is you, in physics anyway, is you start with a topological point, metric space, and then you construct a commutative algebra of functions on top of that space. Whereas you can do it Galvan's, a Galvan said you can do it the other way around. You can start with the commutative algebra and then abstract out the topological properties of your space. And then the points were just the maximum ideals. That's fine for commutative. Algebras. The question is, can you do the same thing for non algebras? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you too? Long story. Long story, yeah. Because I can't answer that question. All right. Yes. You mean if you answer it now, my talk finishes? No, no, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. So now. Let's have a closer look. How, I'm claiming I get Clifford algebras out of this. How do I get Clifford algebras out of this? Well, I say here I've got the idea of we've got one arrow, we've got another arrow. How do we get from this process 
to this process simply by using uh, something else. How, how do I get from one to the other? Well, what I say is, let me introduce another arrow, P1 to P2, and then I define my P1, P2 by my multiplication table. You see, I go from P0, P1 times P1, P2 gives me P0, P2. So I'm going from P0, 1 to P0, uh, P0, P2. If I do it again, you'll see that I've got this thing in the middle there, and that just gives me P0 equal P0, 1, P0, 1 negative sign, which means I've got P1, P2 squares to minus 1. So I've effectively got an I in there. What I've done is I've actually rotated this thing through 90 degrees. Oh, so this, this little cane there, start off with. Yeah. Even so what it was, is it the same complex numbers or any, any field? I would take it as the real field. Oh, well, I, I think right. of it in terms of the... But this is, this is just, all I'm saying is this is behaving like I. But you start off just off. I start off with just off. In fact, I can do everything with the real field. Well, I, 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 I'll reserve that. I'm, I think I can do everything with the real field. Okay, now then, if you uh, change the notation, you find that the multiplication rules I get is just isomorphic to the quaternion algebra. Where I've got the uh, anti commutation relation. And these are just the gammas that people use in, uh, in physics. Now, if we now introduce a mapping from the Clifford algebra, from the process, from the movement space, onto a vector space, then we have three idempotents, P0, P0, P1, P1, P2, P2, and these are just the points of my vector space. I'm doing this the other way around. Normally we start with a vector space and go up into the Clifford algebra. I'm saying, no, 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 let's start with the process in the Clifford algebra and come down onto a vector space. And then if we... Uh, and in the Clifford group here, knowing that we've got a Clifford algebra now, we can use the structure that we've already understood with Clifford group, Clifford algebras, introduce a Clifford group. Then we've got a, an element which looks like that. And if we now map A onto cos theta by 2 and B onto sine theta by 2, we've just got a rotational object in the vector space below, which isn't surprising. Now, can we do the same with the Reins group? Well, this is where the minus sign comes in. And in fact, I follow Lou Kaufman here. I introduce a polar process and a temporal process. In other words, I introduce two types of process here. And then when I combine the temporal process, I introduce the minus sign rather than the plus sign. And when I do that, I get the Clifford group uh, SO11. In other words, I've got a Simple Minkowski space of one time one space dimension. What is this capital T? Does it have the same status as P or P? No. You see now there's a special symbol. Yes, I have. That's, I'm, I'm doing that. That's, that's the idea of calling it polar and temporal, is to actually make this distinction. Okay. No interpretations at the moment. What about TT? TT is just, the ident is just essentially an identity. You know is it? Don't have a T1 and T2. It, no, we can put on, that's the next step, is to put T1 and T2. Okay. Alright, now I want to introduce addition. I haven't used addition so far, I've just done the group tape. I introduced addition, and what I find is that if I add E0, remember now E0 is the P0 T, and E1 is the P0 P1. If I add those two and then use my mapping, it's just t plus or minus x, and that of course is just the light cone coordinates. And the reason why I'm going in that direction is because that's what Luke Kaufman does, and I want to keep up with him, as it were, and show how it fits in with, with what I'm doing. Now, what about velocity? Well, you just consider simply p naught p, p naught t to the minus one. In other words, you think about defining a space-like thing with a time-like thing. And you get minus pt, 
But the trouble is, there's a left inverse and a right inverse, and they're not equal. But the, what you get is E01, which is just Dirac's alpha in the big algebra. And I'm just saying that's why when we map E1 onto the manifold, it becomes a velocity. So if you like, this is a, a, gives a, a raison d'etre for using Dirac's alpha as a velocity in this. Okay, then if you exploit the Clifford group again, and now you have the uh, rapidity to define your uh, mapping into the, the vector space, then you find that you get these light cone coordinates just become this light cone coordinates with the k plus or minus there. Uh, it should be a 1 there, I beg your pardon. And k, of course, is that relationship there. And this is the basis of the k calculus that Luke Kaufman uses to construct the Lorentz group. And these movements, by the way, are rather interesting because they're just movements along this light ray and along the perpendicular light ray. So we've trained, changed um, space movements and time movements into light light movements through the addition. And now I just want to very quickly, I don't want to, to dwell on this at all because I don't have time, this is all in Luke Kaufman's Physics and Knots, where he actually takes, here you've got T1 and T2, Chris, and you actually set up what I've done with the light cone coordinates, and then you get the Lorentz transformation out of that. And that's using Bondi's K calculus with a radar set and a clock to map out your vector space for them. Okay, now if you what I've done is just the two degrees of freedom, but if you add more degrees of freedom in, you get the Pauli Clifford, you get the Dirac Clifford, and you get the conformal Clifford. It goes through straight, uh, quite straightforward. Well, not quite straightforward. You will do one or two extra things to get them there. So you've essentially got this hierarchy of Clifford algebras. But notice there is nothing quantum mechanical here at all. This is just the properties of, or it induces a vector space which has got nothing to do with, with quantum mechanics at all. Okay, now this is where Bob comes in. I don't know whether you recognise what I'm going to do now, Bob. I want to change my symbolism. Here's my original symbolism. Now I want to write it like this, because what you find, because I've got a Clifford algebra, I've got a matrix algebra, so I can essentially represent these things by matrices. Sure, I want it. I don't want it. That's what everybody else does. I don't want to do it. So I've got this object, and now I say, all right, when I do the Clifford group, for example, I multiply on both sides of the object. So I've got an object which looks like that, the multiplication being given by that. Then what I say is let me pull the P across to the G, P1 across to the G1, the P2 across to the G2. And I've got something blue in the middle here. Then what I want to do is I want to cut this thing in the middle here. What I've effectively got is a left ideal and a right ideal. So I've now pulled my things apart, but pulled them apart in such a way that the idempotent, this is an idempotent structure here, you see, this idempotent means that when I multiply these two together, I've still got them glued together with that idempotent. So these idempotents are playing a special role in this. And what I've got here are just spinners. They're the algebraic spinners. And then, when I've got the thing like this, it's an operator. When I actually join the line around here, it's essentially a trace, as Lewis pointed out. So we've got a complex number. And where I got this idea from was reading Dirac. He introduced something which he called the standard ket. And I'm not being stupid here. It's not the ket that we normally use. The normal ket we use is we put a line in front of it here. In Dirac's book, he actually said, throw that line away and deal with this object which has no bar in front of it. And for a lot of time I wondered what the hell he was doing. Because he then had a standard bra, so he had things like this. And that object there, I claim, is just my hidden as it behaves exactly like an hidden And incidentally, what I'm doing here is what Dirac does in his little monograph on spinners of Hilbert space. 
but I have not mentioned Hilbert space at all here because I'm in the algebra. I'll mention Hilbert space later on. Excuse me? Do you put some minimality condition on the eigenpotent? Yes. Sorry, I should have said that. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm doing it quickly, but yes. Okay, so now let's have a look at the meaning of this symbolism a little more in more detail. Uh, as I'm saying, the idempotent is important because it determines the distinction. If I choose another idempotent, I've got another distinction. Now then I want to swap my line of thought and go to Feynman's PhD thesis. And in that thesis, this is something that's always stuck with me, it's, it's in red mod fees, by the way, is that Feynman suggested that the wave function over region R1 was information coming from the past, whereas psi star was information coming from the future. Those are his words, not mine. And then he showed that essentially what you've got here is a Huygens construction, and if you put the left right together, you've actually got uh, a Schrodinger's equation coming out of this from that construction. Okay? So we're putting it back together again. Now then, so that's just to be kept in the back of your mind at the moment. That's the, that's the type of analogy I'm, I'm working on to. Now let's have a look. How do I get light rays from what I'm doing? Well, let's go to the Pauli algebra. And in the Pauli algebra, there is an idempotent, which is 1 plus E3 over 2. E3 is always chosen because of historical reasons, the magnetic field is always in the z direction. You can do this with any vector if you like. So I'm taking the traditional view, and then if I form an element of my left ideal, which is that way, then, if I work that out, I find it's actually just a, a, a scalar and a bivector, which is where the uh, Penrose's his flag plane comes in. Then I want to form an object which is closing this. Here's the element of the left ideal, the element of the right ideal, multiply them together. And what I find if I multiply this all out is I'm left with a vector. And I find that V1, V2, V3, and V0 are related in this way. And this, if you work out V0 squared plus V1 squared plus V2 squared plus V3 squared, you actually find it's equal to zero. So I'm actually, it's a null ray. I'm actually describing, that line is describing a light ray in my vector space. And now if I use the uh, Clifford group on that, I actually generate with the light ray the light cone. So what I can do from here is generate the light cone. And this is where, oh, this, this in case you see some of these things are familiar, it's normally presented in the elementary books in terms of a matrix representation. But I'm doing exactly the same thing, only not in a matrix representation, not in Hilbert space or anything, but directly in the algebra itself. Okay, so what I've got here then is I've got a light cone. If I go to the Dirac algebra, which is here, here is the four elements of the uh, Dirac spinner. Two of them describe the future light cone, the other two describe the, light, the past light cone. So the Dirac spinner is actually describing light cones for you. And then the twister is just simply relating light cones at different points in space. So you've got to structure your light cones coming out of this algebra. Okay. But so far, nothing to do with quantum mechanics. Even though I'm using some of the tools that we use in quantum mechanics, there's no quantum mechanics. Now, how do we introduce something which is going to look like quantum mechanics? So what I need now is I want to introduce another pair of processes. Okay, so I've now got four distinct processes in what I'm doing. The temporal, the polar, which are those two there. 
but I'm also introducing the same thing in the, what is going to be a momentum space. I'm doubling up the spaces that are good here. And now what I want to do is, because I know Heisenberg's work, I want to introduce the Heisenberg computation relationship in my language. Okay, and I'm going to put H bar in one because it doesn't interest me. What about the linear combinations? I, I can do. I just want to concentrate on this at the moment to see the structure I'm getting at. Okay? Just want to show you the way I'm heading. A lot of details one can do with this. Rather than play with the continuum, which is what Heisenberg played with, I want to play with a discrete vial algebra. And this is an algebra that was discussed by Morris. And you probably recognise this algebra, Chris, because you refereed the paper, if you remember. You can't remember that topic. No, it's not Okay. Did I pass the paper? Fortunately or unfortunately, yes. <laughs> So I can point out it's all your fault now. <laughs> the particular, I replace that commutation relation with this relation here, where omega is the nth root of unity. And this mathematical structure actually has a very, uh, a very long history. It goes back to Sylvester's day, which is 18 something or other. And if you put n equals to 3, these are his non-ions, and then you generalize it to any p, and then they're p-ions, or whatever you like to call them. And they're to do with the, the Clifford algebra of the quadratic form, the non-ions of the cubic form, and so on. That's the mathematical background to this. Okay, so then, I want to simplify, because you can see this notation is going to get horrendous if I keep on with all these n's and n's and n's. So I want to simplify them. So this, so here is my quantum, uh, here is my algebra that I'm dealing with. And when n goes to infinity, Weil has shown us that this actually becomes the Heisenberg algebra plus. It's an extended Heisenberg algebra. It's one of the things that held me up for a long time. Okay, so what I've got is a discrete phase space here, and it's non-commutative. Now what I want to do is to just show the time down. I want to just show you how this works. Remember, idempotence are points in this story. So I look for idempotence in this algebra, and I find they exist. And then I want to know how you relate the idempotence. When you relate the idempotence by the same type of uh, transformation, a sort of a, a generalized Clifford group here, and this T takes me from one point to the next. So if I look at these as position points, then this is just the transformation, and I write it as P there, and that's the P that is the momentum. It turns out to be the momentum. And I've got here the uh, elements of the left ideal with a, an op operator, I'll put it in quotes, to give me position. What I can also do, though, is take another set of points, and in this set of points, I use V to translate from point to point. And therefore, what I have here is a momentum space. So I created a position space in this toy model and a momentum space. And it's related, these idempotents are related by transformations like this, where this Z is actually that thing. It's actually a Fourier finite, it's a finite Fourier transform. Now then, what does this mean? This means that because I cannot have these points simultaneously presented, presented, it means I either have the x or I have the p. And then when I move, use this transformation, I transform the points of x into the points of p, but in such a way that each point of x is spread over every point of p. In other words, the P points are not hidden. So if you're thinking about any uncertainty principle coming from this, it's not because we're hand-fisted and we disturb things. It's because the actual structure does not allow P points when we're looking at X points and vice versa. So this gives a kind of an ontological complementarity principle, if you like. And this is where David Bohm came in with his n-folded order, that the 
P points, when you've got an X representation, the P points are not hidden, but they are not manifest. They are, in, they are enfolded in the actual structure. Now then, what I've got here is the uh, uh, is a finite structure. What happens in the continuum limit? Well, the continuum limit is that these idempotents that I've got here just become delta functions. And that was done very nicely by... It's already been done, this is all history, it's already been done in VAR. If you translate the language slightly into this, once again, I've got to, got to go fairly quickly. Then, if you consider the limit, what one finds, and this is the importance, all this is in VAR's book, x becomes the wave function. Okay, this x, remember, is our element of our minimal left ideal. It becomes the wave function. And u becomes the transformation which takes psi of q. You recognize these. Anybody who knows anything about quantum mechanics immediately recognizes those transformations. And in fact, it's just the item of group. So by introducing that uh, commutation relation in the sense that I've introduced it, I have actually got the Heisenberg group in my structure. Which again is not surprising. I mean, none of this is surprising. It's just rather interesting the way it comes out. And therefore the general structure I have here is that you've got this process space, which David Bohm called the implicate order, and then from that you can abstract various shadow lines. And in this case, the shadow manifolds are the, the phase spaces, as I'll show in a minute. Okay, so we've got this structure. Am I okay for talking about? Oh, was that all? Oh, oh, God. Okay, let me do it very quickly. I've got this. Give me 10 and I'll finish. I put in the joke about uh, Alex Comfort, which is. <laughs> okay, so what I've got here is I've got my Clifford algebra, algebra here with my covering group, with my Clifford group, double cover, and I've got here my vector space. Now what I want to do is to do the same thing in my algebraic structure, but now I want to introduce a connection on the base manifold. Actually, I want to produce a connection in the Clifford algebra. Now the interesting thing about the Clifford algebra is that there are two connections. There's only one connection in the vector space. But in the Clifford algebra there is two connections, the left and the right. Acting on the left uh, ideal, acting on the right ideal. And they're written like that. Okay? So if you want to bring in, and, and this operator here I should point out, this is just the Dirac operator. If you put E's into the gammas, that's just the Dirac operator. But here it's quite general. Okay. Now then, let me just relate the two because the normal way we play about things is we've got a Hilbert space. If I'm working in the algebra here, I've got a more general space. In fact, I've got, if you just take the Pauli case, there are two distinct left ideals, one with 1 plus E3 and the other one with 1 minus E3. Now both of those, uh, they form an equivalence class which you can actually map onto your Hilbert space. So what you're doing is you're reducing the structure from the uh, algebra to the Hilbert space here. And now then, because you've got two derivatives, I say you need two algebraic Schrodinger equations. One acting from the left and one acting from the right. Now what is the consequence of that? What you can do now is that you could, because you've got these two equations, you can add them or you can subtract them, in fact the other way around. You subtract them, the reason for the subtraction here is because the i changes the sign. Or you can sum them. If you look at the sum, Look at the, uh, this relation here, and this essentially is the Louvian equation. And if you look at this equation here, you've essentially got an anti-commutator, like that as a, a commutator, you've got an anti-commutator here, 
And I'm putting the word anonymous because I've never seen this equation written down anywhere else except in that print right there. But I've since found it appears everywhere, but no one picks it out as an important equation. Uh, now then, since this is to do with energy on this side, could it be that this object here has actually got something to do with energy, and then when we change the T to the gradient, could this be something to do with momentum? Okay. Right then, now then, let's just look at what these things are in the special case of what I'm going to call the Schrodinger particle because I'm using the Clifford algebra 0, 1, where I've got 1 and E, where E squared is equal to minus 1. And this is over the reals. The minus 1 is coming in through the elements of the algebra. So we have general element of my left ideal is that. The conjugate, which is the right ideal, is that. And if I write this left ideal as rho to the 1 half u, I get u, u tilde, u tilde u is equal to 1. So I've got something or something on there. And I've got psi r psi l is just equal to rho times epsilon. And this thing here is just the density operator. It just becomes a density matrix, essentially, if you want to translate it into. And there, there, there shows you what these two things are. Now then, work out the details. If you put in E, what you find is that E equals minus dt of S, which is just the Bohm energy. If you do the same with P, you find grad S, which is just the Bohm momentum. And here it's got nothing to do with guiding or all that crap of the Mickey Mouse Bohm model. This is to do with the structure of the Clifford algebra that you're using here. It's a necessary consequence of that Clifford algebra structure. Okay, now what about this equation here? Well, if you use E, which was equal to that that we got in the previous slide, you find that you get this equation here. This is the plus sign again. And this is actually the what I've been calling for years now the quantum hamilton jacobi equation. doesn't look like it from there. This is then just the phase. And there's the gauge invariance, fine, it all works beautifully. And if you write psi L in this form, then what you find is that that equation is nothing more or less than the Bohm equation with the quantum potential. So what you've done is you've manufactured one of these shadow phase spaces I've talked talking to you about earlier. That you construct the x, you're in the x representation here, so you take a, an x axis and then you construct a momentum P and construct an energy in this way. And then your dynamics is defined by that equation, and that's the why the Bohm, why the Bohm theory can actually work. Is this connected with the Lyapunov transformation? Uh, it, you, you can put it. If this is I haven't used it here, but you can show that in the Moyan algebra, you get exactly the same two. Let's, let me just go back here. You get this is replaced by the Moyal bracket, and this is replaced by the Baker bracket. And if you use the Baker bracket and you remember deformation algebras, this equation actually reduces in the limit of order h-bar to the hamilton jacobi equation, which is why I call this other equation here the quantum hamilton jacobi equation. Okay. Now I can do the momentum representation, so I've got a shadow manifold where p and x, and so I have Typical example of what I'm doing here. If I start with the algebra process, then I can get that. And now my conclusions. All right, if I just quickly go through these. Show that the, from the process, by using the orthogonal and the symplectic group point, you can get a generalized Clifford algebra. In fact, what I've got here is a combination of an orthogonal Clifford algebra and a symplectic Clifford algebra. And the symplectic Clifford algebra was something I went around asking people in the physics community if they knew anything about it, and they all said no. And then I discovered that there's a guy called Krumerol who has done a book showing the relation between the two. 
I'm sure mathematicians know about that. They can be uh, the synthetic Clifford algebra. Right now, then, if you enlarge the Clifford algebra, you've got the Bow, the Pauli, the Dirac, and the conformal structures in there. You've got a non-commutative structure giving you shallow manifolds. And what I'm claiming is that the quantum and relativistic processes live in the covering space, not in the space-time manifold as such. Now the interesting thing for those people who have ever looked at the Bohm theory and given it five minutes thought, by doing this method, not only can you do the Pauli equation, but you can also do the Dirac equation. And you get a quantum potential for the Dirac equation. So all these guys out there who say the Bohm cannot do relativity are wrong. You can. What happens if you introduce a Dirac? It is a single particle. Yeah, it is a single particle. Do you want me to? <laughs> you can bring it in. But you're going to get a much more complicated structure, but it'll work. Do you get use the problem? Oh, you're going to get, look, I haven't got rid of any problems. I've just tried to push them somewhere else. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> but the interesting thing about this is that, that you can extend it to many particle systems. Oh, oh sorry. It's not the end yet. I, I know you want me to end there. You can extend it to many particle systems, and then you've got the question of quantum non-locality, and that's taken care of in the quantum potential at the moment. The way you do it at the moment. And also, you've got non-locality in the Dirac theory. You don't get rid of non-locality in this way. It's there in the, in the relativistic theory. Then you can extend this, because the, the connections I use were just flat connections. But you can actually use connections on, on, on a curved manifold. I haven't investigated that. Although I did work out uh, vacuum expectation values of the energy momentum tensor, and it turned out to be the quantum potential. Uh, you can also generalise this by exploring different algebras, I've done it again, and we really need a more careful mathematical analysis of this. Now I'll finish. Thank you very much. In, not in the way I've done it so far, but I haven't really looked at that. I mean, I've only got the quantum, the, the actual expression for the quantum potential in the last two months. You know, you know yeah, I will do. When it comes, I'm still working on it. I'm sorry, it's a horrendous calculation. It is for me anyway. It, it's, it's a long thing that uh, it's slowly been, been uh, all the mistakes are slowly being knocked down. So, where's this program going? The big goal is I'm hoping to say something about quantum gravity. Oh, evidence is that. Well, that's the way I'm going. I want to, want to investigate what happens to this structure when we've got curvature. And whether we learn anything new or not, I don't know. But Why at least it's quantum gravity. Sorry? It's not quantum gravity yet. What I, what I haven't discussed is how you do field theory. Well, we've already, in, in the book that David Bohm and I wrote, we already dealt with quantum field theory using this particular approach. You can translate everything that I've said here into a field theoretical approach. Now, maybe there, one will see something about quantum gravity problem, because you've got a proper field theory there. But I say you're still carrying in the, the problems that you've got with all the fields. And what do you gain from using this approach as opposed to you mean you gain clarity on what's going on? Oh, well, that's, what, that's really nice, but in terms of actual technique for doing things, I mean, you've shown how you recover familiar things. Yes, yeah. Uh, of course, familiar things have to be important. So, okay, that's the weakness of this. I mean, you know, well, I've already I'm asking possibly a question. Here, considering, what? Chris, I've only convinced myself that this is worth talking about in public in the last three months or so. Well, I'm not trying to No, I know, but I'm, I'm just saying that I haven't, investi I haven't investigated that yet. I'm sorry, there's a lot more to be done. So, the food is waiting upstairs, and I think we should go. Okay, thank you. Again. Thank you.